just in case, but I think we're recording, so I think we'll be in good shape. So uh, thank you, Rob, for making the food. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And let's uh, get this uh, started. Uh, how do you usually start your Q&A session? I, I, usually... I always say, like, this is a really <laughs> unique moment because after a film is over, it's almost like you're at a state where you're not in your analytical mind or you're, like, survival mode as much because you've been opened up. So the mood right now is a unique moment to just get gut reactions before you get over analytical about pieces of it or anything. So I would just like a reaction. How do you feel? What do you, what, what you feel like you learned or didn't learn? What did you reject? What, you know, what are more your instinctive feelings about it? Because analysis, I think, is once removed from, from it at this point. Persuasive, you know, not what you got. I mean, I'd never heard about any of this before mm -hmm. uh, a couple hours ago when you mentioned it, so I thought it was really interesting how it all came together, um, like politics wise, uh, to kind of, you know, set the stage in like the back um, without people knowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, te even though I'm a filmmaker first, there's a teacher in me too that just knows that there's a lot of interesting history that young people just don't know, period, before you get into how you shape it or what your opinions are. About it, just as like facts that are just, I think there's just not a room, enough room in the modern campus to get into certain history, so you, you miss this, but it's, it seemed pretty important. Don't be shy now, I mean, come on. Yeah, I thought it was cool. I didn't really know a lot of the connections between like Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul and kind of like how you, like in your movie, kind of like intertwine them and kind of showing like the parallels, like as they grew up. And assassination attempt, but I, I knew they both had assassination attempt, but I didn't know they were so close together, kind of intertwined like that, so I thought that was pretty cool and cool. Yeah, I tend not to be one of these people like looking for, ooh, spooky, but this one's kind of getting weird, like after a while, like so many things, because even though they were culturally so different, in a way, in mission, the fact they both were well informed by their suffering, their faith, and an anti-communist streak, because they both saw it faith right up close, and they knew what communism was. I mean, I think in mission, you could look at it as like concentric circles. Maybe one played football and one skied or whatever, you know. But as you go deep toward the middle, they knew what freedom, how, how it felt to have freedom removed right in the face. It wasn't an idea, it was actually. So that, that'll galvanize you. And then when you, you get that close to death, then you realize what it really matters. Now think about their mission before that. You could, ar you could argue that John Paul II was already a priest. He's like a cardinal, he already gave his life for other people, but he still felt like he was galvanized by that experience. So death will really make it real for you, you know, and I think that was there, as we say in drama, the inciting incident. That was the moment where you're gonna really make your ultimate choice what you wanna do because you came that close to losing your life. <coughs> also, don't forget they were both ex-actors. So you can't, as someone who crossed over from film into religious world or politics you have to realize like how much acting informs your life it's not just being fake acting is an orientation to learning how to how to take inventory of your environment make decisions how to demonstrate truth not talk it not just say with your words but how do you do dem demonstrative acts in the world that teach truth so they they knew a lot I mean to do Reagan did 80 plus films now he probably was like a B plus actor ultimately he wasn't a Jimmy Stewart but to do 80 films and hit all your marks and know how to, that's, that's a real accomplishment. And to be the leading theatrical actor of your time at the Pope and then give that up where he wrote his own play. They both wrote scripts and plays. And so if you take that into this story, I can imagine one of the taglines we'll use for promo will be something like, two ex-actors who found their greatest performance on the world stage or something like that, where they never got it totally right in the acting or theatrical world. And not on the screen, but on the world stage, they have to play their roles. The divine plan play or whatever, you know. <clears throat> okay, I've got to ask the, the students a question. How many of you have never seen a movie with Ronald Reagan in it from his acting days? How many of you have never seen one of them? Mm -hmm. Thought so. Crazy. Yeah. What, what do we recommend? King's Row, Bedtime for Bonzo? I mean, what's the... I mean, I, I'll know. be honest with you, he, I, he's not a great actor, but he gets the job done. He's like a role, a great role-playing actor, but he when he hits, like, uh, the Gipper, I mean, that's like, you know, he fits the he fits the Gipper, I mean, because that's kind of... He's like he's like a, a blend of um, old, old Americana, kind of evangelical manifest destiny religion. He has that kind of Main Street, the Kiwanis Club, like America generally 
is a good place, well attended. Like he comes from that Jimmy, it's a wonderful life. That's his world. So he plays that on in the movies. And when, but he did, he did play that dark when he loses his leg. What was that? That was King's Row. King's Row, yeah. So that, yeah. that's his best performance, yeah. Plus, he's the only U.S. president to be born in Illinois. Is he? He is. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, because uh, Lincoln was born in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think there's also that Midwestern totally. all America boy rescuing 77 drowning women wanted to be saved by Ronald Reagan jumping into water, so. I, I, think, I think that was more related to the alcoholism, like this is sure. my, my, this is like subjective, but I think his cognitive dissonance came from having to survive an alcoholic sure. life. So people who generally have one or two, both parents or a history of alcoholism, they put up a shield because they can't trust the external world because it's always changing on him. He moved something like 20 something times. His dad was like a shoe salesman constantly moving so his mom actually, who was, his father was Catholic, like but not a practicing Catholic. His mom was disciples of Christ, and she actually s steered him away from his dad toward the pastor of her church and like the elders in her church to give him mentors to go. And then he started to speak to Bible classes, and he understood he was a good speaker, and that's where he developed his identity. Here, here's a funny stat. So who do you, in terms of the California of the Reagan time, when he first went to California, where do you think most people came from who were in California, who migrated from another state? Where do you think that state was? Just a, just a trivia question. Me or? It's related to the Midwest. That's uh, why I'm throwing a satchel right. It's probably going to be, let's see, Ohio. Iowa. Iowa, yeah. yeah. So the most, so people were migrating because don't forget, they didn't want to be poor, and Hollywood represented that glamorous life of being above it all if you didn't have the money and you worked. And, but I think his saving, is, it plays out in his whole life. He was one. Save the country, save the history, save. All right, and he was mm -hmm. served in World War II in the army, like most U.S. presidents before. So there was probably all that. He he did he actually could not serve physical activity right. because he actually had Coke bottle. I don't know if you know it's one of the first people to have contact lenses. He had Coke bottle glasses and was a bit of a nerd in college. So actually, he wound up going into the communications unit. So on top of being an actor, he also watched all the propaganda films and actually stole two reels of the Holocaust that he kept secretly in his house because he wanted to show his kids when they grew up, like this is what freedom looks, this is what it looks like when you take freedom away. He wanted to, and he had, he had them until later in his life to oh, show them, yeah. <clears throat> he was a nerd, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, I thought it was really interesting how similar their lives were <coughs> from childhood all the way until death, like their fathers died at similar times, they got shot at similar times. <coughs> and then they died at similar times. I just thought that was very fascinating. I had no idea that they had all those similarities. Like there could be a plan? Yeah, almost. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it feels that way. It feels like there's a design to things, because even in the book, we we decided to write the book because the research was so overwhelming, trying, just making the movie, that we're like, people would, so if you look at the way their training comes together, they both they both survived their, their children of World War II, so they know D-Day. You have to understand that's a different generation that you, it's not like you're, something that you read in the book. It's actually your father hit the beaches, or you hit the beach, and you saw a Nazi gunfire coming at you. And you so then this is kind of like the 80s D-Day to me, but without the major war. It's kind of a proxy. It later becomes proxy wars. but So it's they're, they're sensitized by their environment and their time and their legacy that's also defining them. So even though they're also from different countries, don't forget Poland fights with the Allies to defeat the Nazis. There's a lot of unification there. People knew what tyranny was, and they unified against it. Most of the, most of the world. Let me give the panelists, uh, yeah, the other yeah. panelists, a chance to ask Rob some questions mm -hmm. and get some conversation going there, and then we'll throw it back to the audience. Yeah. No, you start. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I, I did enjoy the film. Um, you know, I, I uh, teach political science, but I also have a really deep interest in religion and politics. And I had just taught a class like two hours ago, um, where I was talking about influence of the moral majority and Billy Graham and then later Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson on American politics. So I thought what was interesting is their kind of absence in the film, right? Because we know that, I mean, first you have um, uh, Billy Graham and Richard Nixon have a very close bond, but then they try to reach out to Jimmy Carter and then they find that he's not the right kind of Christian. And then you have the forming of this moral majority, but they were absent in this film. And I, I, I really have to ask that question because, you know, we've only had one Catholic president, 
and that is John F. Kennedy, who's also not mentioned once in the film. And yet the film is so much, the film is not really about Catholicism, right? It's about faith. But I did want to ask, like, I find it hard to believe that some of these moral majority folks would have been okay with so many close overtures towards the Catholic Church because they had a very different vision of the America that they wanted. Like, I, by modern standards, I would say that they are were Christian nationalists. <coughs> so I wanted to ask you... Um, yeah, yeah, um, I, I'm trying to think of how, how much time do we have. <laughs> um, there, there is this bifurcation in, the Christian, in Christian history that... I'm a revert Catholic, by the way, so I've been... I've been a Catholic and evangelical. If I went to the level of going to Reform seminaries, Protestant, Presbyterian, so I actually live within the camps of all these. Even I was never a fundamentalist, which is what you describe, which is the fringe of evangelical. It's sure. not really. So technically, Reagan could be called an evangelical, but he wouldn't. I think he'd be a mainstream evangelical. With he went to a Presbyterian church, but his experience at the time, and it was also the Hal Lindsey, the lens of looking through the apocalypse as the reformation of evangelicals because the, end, the world was coming to an end because it was going into modernism. I, mean, I, I could go on for a half hour explaining why there's a distinction, but I broke it down to three things from doing this so much. One is that the tradition of America is very closely knit together with Protestantism because it's about removing yourself or avoiding the divine right of kings and popes. The whole reformation is a react, so one reason one. So by definition, governance, it's hard to have a monarchical system that where your divine exists without it being anti-American in, in your mind. I don't, we can, sure. we can go beyond that. Two is that um, Reformation is born out of the corruption of Catholicism, period. I mean, um, Luther is, is actually rebelling against the fact that, um, I can't remember his name, but the bishop he was fighting against was collecting indulgences to build the Vatican. So he was, he was using, expo uh, exploiting people to build the Vatican. Sure. So the Reformation is always known as the anti-cleanup party for Catholicism, so it has that truth to it, you know. Right. But the other part is that Protestantism also has a different definition geographically, because it's an American, largely an American phenomena, a British or an Anglo phenomena going away as Puritans, but it's all about manifest destiny, the Westerner, you know, individualism, it's not a communal sure. divinity, it's a whole, it's, it's not as, it's not mother church, it's about you can do this, you can get your property and your land, and sure. God is with you, and you know, city on a hill and you're gonna realize. So they just are different trajectories where if you look at the constants of Christianity, you look at the contingencies there. Constants, if you go deep enough, are probably all the same. But their contingency of where they're born out of culturally and in real time are very different. So they have a tension that's not quite resolved today. Um, and when you look at like the preachers, it's kind of like the low hanging fruit. The preachers of the Falwells and all that are really just kind of the televangelist top they get the most exposure, but they're really born of the fundamentalist movement that goes down to the Scopes trial and the turn of the 20th sure. century. So fundamentals were just like, what can we believe anymore given science and evolution? So I, that's my quick answer, but we, that would take a semester to talk sure. about that accuracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you like to ask? Yeah, um, I think you heard a question there, probably about where interested in this mind, but um, I thought, I noticed several times it highlighted um, what we would, and the church referred to as Catholic social teaching, especially the human dignity and the, um, and Catholic social teaching, which is kind of how the church would say that, like, if it were going, all of its kind of political um, arms and reasons would come out of these uh, nine different teachings, themes, and the number one of them is the um, dignity of the human person. So I noticed that you highlighted that a number of times in the film. Do you think that um, the words um, res sacra, I noticed you used those um, from Reagan, do you think that that really highlights the thought of all American people during that time? Or was that something that was like very particular to Reagan that might have, um, you know, folded in well with Pope John Paul II, but not necessarily the wider population. So I'm, I'm not that old, but I, I was a kid <laughs> during that, and I would say that I I think that was largely assumed because they didn't, they didn't, we didn't feel like there were forces that strong that were challenging that basic idea that the West, and informed by Judeo-Christian ideals, was uniquely different because it did start from the premise that individuals 
should be given the right or the value before the state as a starting point. And we all know it can't be one without the other, but to the degree, so I, I would say like that's why they united so much, because if you're looking at communism and you're like, how did we get, so communi com communism doesn't show up with the army. Like state control, totalitarianism doesn't show up with an army. It shows up in high ideals. It always starts with high ideals. It's the high ideals that get slippery slopes and then it doesn't work. And through high ideals and poverty and imperialism, communism took over over a long period of time. It got its tentacles all over the world. But that's what the state does. It comes in when life's real challenges become overbearing. Uh, but then you don't remember that you don't remember the dignity of individuals because at that point people are desperate, right? When the banking the banking of 2008 fell, you don't care who you get a loan from. You're just going to grab a loan because your house is going under, you know. So it's it's a hard time to push back, and when you when you're in a struggle to push back and say, but the individual. But when you see long term the trajectory of life, that the state once it gets control doesn't let go at all. It's almost like you got to go back to saying, well, if you don't start for this, as dangerous as risky as it is, if you don't start for the individuals being valuable enough to be seen as sacred in and of itself and make its own decisions, then you're going to eventually get in trouble again because power will be shifted up to something that becomes more foreign to your needs or your initial identity as the time goes on, and that's just human corruption. And, and faith, by the way, let's not forget, faith informs that fact. Oh. You take the faith out of that equation, I, I think you do have a hard time proving that, that it is life is sacred. I think you have a hard time proving that. Can I ask another question? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Is that okay, or yeah, is there absolutely. burning? Uh, okay, so um, it's a question that connects the, to the present, right, and that is, so I just had a, um, I studied refugee policy among many things, and I just had a small article published, and one of the things I did was, I looked at refugee admissions to the United States over time from 1975 to the present, and one of the things I mentioned in the article was that, although refugee admissions are very low right now under President Trump, you know, that is unkind commentary on past Republican presidents. One of the things I learned, and this is, I'll come to the question, one of the things I learned was that under President Reagan, on average, the eight years of his president, at least 85 to 90,000 refugees were admitted to the U.S. every year he was president. It's a staggeringly large number. So uh, along that basis, I want to ask, what is something new you learned about President Reagan from doing this film? Well, Reagan, Reagan beat an incumbent in 44 states, 44 states, and then won 49 states. So just think about that. The demographics today are about 10% different. So even if you give the, the change of demographics some credibility in terms of immigration changes in the culture, sure. whatever, um, he's winning 49 states. So I'm saying to you that that's not just some puppet, master puppet. He's speaking about our aspirations. He's, he's not coming from a, a binary, divisive position of like everything you identify as true has to be in opposition to some antagonist. So he's, he's setting a transcendent tone. I think Carter meant to do that, but he just wasn't as good at it. I actually put Carter in there so that when people watch it, they realize it's not about a party here. It's about an aspiration of like, because Carter gave over the whole mechanism, anti-Cold War machine to Reagan. Reagan just picked up and ran with it. And just to show you, I think there is a decency streak that might be missing too, obviously. Um, but at the, at, before they had the debate, the final debate where Carter um, was going to debate Reagan, and, and Reagan was going to probably win anyway. But the news came in about the hostages. They knew in advance that they'd be released. And they gave that secret info to Reagan, like, take them out. Say it in the debate. Well, they, we just heard, now that they know I'm going to be president, they let them out. And he said, I would never bring that up in the debate. He never. He didn't use that as the fodder to win the debate. He just, there's a certain, and I, I think that's changed. I think it is. There is a identification through victim binary way of thinking that's corroding more and more and more. And I, I, I think that's the, that, so the difference I learned was that you could be aspiration, you could not lose your personal convictions. Reagan's still a conservative, a classic conservative. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, bet, I wouldn't match him to the modern president, but, but I think he's a, he's a mainstream conservative, basically. As a matter of fact, he, he was known as a peacenik at his time against his own conservative people. Bill uh, Wills, Gary, what's his name? Um, Wills, the, the writer of National Review and everything, but they oh. thought he was soft on communism, that he was a peacenik because he wanted to trade nuclear weapons. And so all these categories and, and labels are always changing according to context. So I, I learned about Reagan that if you stay in a transcendent mode and you realize that you have to see the higher goal all the time, that ultimately it's a longer term win-win than getting in the dirt and fighting all the time. He said, I'd rather win 80% 
but then rather go over the hill with my flags waving. <coughs> you mean George Will? George Will. Yeah. Thank you. There's a Gary Will. It's a little complicated. It's a Gary Hart. So. <laughs> Other questions from. I have tons of questions. So I can keep going. <laughs> Someone else, kind of summarize that. Yeah. Are you are you quiet because you have no questions, or you just don't want to say what you really think, or, or are you just shy? All right. All right. How long did it take you to make the movie? So that's a great question. The movie itself, if I could just condense the actual production of like thinking of it, writing it, shooting it, probably six to seven to nine months, probably. The whole process of like fundraising and is like two years yeah but if I had all the funding up front it probably the whole thing would have been maybe a year something like that yeah. yes how come the Soviet Union let the Pope like go to Poland at the beginning of the movie like to go against the Soviet they, they didn't they didn't let him he, uh -oh. he went, <laughs> oh, he went. Well, yeah. at least to my knowledge as so the Pope requested to go one time before and was denied. Um, they said, like, ain't gonna happen. But it was really a significant thing that, like, they realized they were losing some power and to continue to tell the West that they could not enter was going to get them into more <coughs> political trouble. So when uh, John Paul II went to Poland, each time he went, they really tried to heavily um, monitor what he was doing and where he was going. That didn't always work very well, but they did deny him at least one, possibly two times going, but he successfully went. And it was really, if you like imagine like a thread ripper, those trips were just ripping threads out of um, the hold they had in Poland because as your movie mentioned, well, it gave um, people a lot of hope, but ultimately, to answer your question, the communists realized like allowing him in allowed them to exist longer and to have more control than keeping him out completely. Right. They they went to like their first first of all they did try and stop him, right? As a matter of fact, they were just shocked that that this was going on. I remember I was reading the the documents of Brezhnev. He was like, Fault he's going to well tell him he can't go, you know. Like they had no idea but what what happened was what the communists did so well is they create suspicion in everyone and, it, and the, the church went on the ground and the Polish people went on the ground. So they didn't really know, like, if I come out, am I going to get my head cut off? Like, is it, is it just my family wants to be free? Or is it like, but when they went on the streets, the Pope gave them the license and said, wait a second, there's thousands of us and we all feel the same way. Like, who's going to defeat us? So there was a point where the tipping point is the communists can't control them. So they do, they go to a big plan, they start getting puppet leaders and their generals and so then they try to control through like the military, and but they just can't because the, the point about faith, you have, you have to understand too for the Polish people, the history of where they come from as a buffer state between the Soviets and Germany for years. This goes back 200 years of fighting. They've been abused. They were both attacked in World War II. They were abandoned at Yalta. I mean, they had history. They went underground. They had no respect for themselves nationally. Their religion was tied into that. The church was the only organizing principle that could fight communism. Um, they had a whole, you were unleashing such a repressed spirit in the Polish people that there was no holding them back. So that's all, on the top of that, if you know you have the U.S. military behind you, <laughs> walk, walk softly and carry U.S. military in you. I mean, it was just no stopping them at that point. So it was really an economics and propaganda game, but they had lost. And the other thing, too, is they had too many secrets. They knew that if they were going to have it all out with a propaganda war, they were going to lose because then they're going to start looking at their waste factories and their the poverty lines and so they could. Have. So I met. I, I was on stage with Herb Meyer, who was Bill Casey's right hand man with Gates for years, and he he was the one who wrote up the memo for Casey, and this was the clue of why they knew the Soviet Union would fall that they gave to Reagan. And I don't remember it exactly, but it's something like the the CIA or one of the intelligence agencies got wind of the fact that at, at the end of their work day, all the typewriters, they would steal the tape out of their typewriters as they went into it. And they was like, why would they steal the tapes? Because they would stay late at night and copy Solzhenitsyn's works, like so they could share it with other people, almost like themselves and self-propagating Solzhenitsyn's work. He was like, that's it. You can't, if they're repressing things at that level, then it's just a matter of just pulling that string and this whole thing is going to collapse. You know? 
remind me to tell you over dinner. Uh, so my wife is from Romania and lived under communism and uh, was very involved in her church and uh, did some interesting things with a typewriter. I'll tell you. Uh, mm, oh, really? About that. But interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, yeah, the, the history of Eastern Europe. I mean, the Cold War is kind of ancient history for these folks. That's well, do you remember Doug, um, Douglas Brinkley saying? Um, David Brinkley. I'm sorry, saying uh, Douglas Brinkley saying he said this might be Cold War II. Which, which you think is interesting because World War I, they thought that was the war to end all wars, but actually it was the antecedent to World War II. So do you think, was the Cold War completely, did we vanquish the Russians or is there a Cold War II coming? And maybe it's cyber, who knows? World War to end all Cold Wars and then you find out, oh no, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you ended with Putin, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, uh, I'm sure you get some people talking about that, mm -hmm. but yeah. So again, that's another that's another course there to teach. But so li liberation theology is the Marxist thread of Catholicism over time. Um, so you have to understand if you want to look at this more cynically, let's look at this very politically and cynically, right? Which would be more modern to do. <laughs> but if you look at it, it's a triangulation, right? Because what did Dick Allen say? Not Dick Allen. The general um, the general of the film is going to the Vatican. He says it's it's the oldest intelligence agency in the world, right? So if you think about it, you have the Pope on your team and you have a lot of like liberation theology bishops joining with Marxists in South America and the CIA trying to repress that while they're fighting the Cold War. So it was like a triangulation because I think they knew that if they if they work with the Pope to help them with Poland and Eastern Europe that in return he could help them with the communication lines to try and but but again it, it wasn't I don't think it's as simple as like was Reagan like an oppressive, warmongering president trying to oppress? No, it was that he, these, these third world groups were in their own revolutions, and those revolutions were blending with the church, and it was getting pretty cloudy or blurry as to which groups to support or not, and I, I think it's just the nature of the beast of being in geopolitical, the geopolitical spheres. And it, it was coming from a Marxist perspective too, so, which is an interesting conversation of like, where does one end and the other one begin? And what what's favorable about that or not? That's a, that's a whole other conversation. But so I don't think I don't think he was saying, hey, let's oppress Nicaragua. They were probably like the CIA always does. How do you, if your neighbor is storing ammunition on your block, right? And every night you, eventually you're going to knock on the door, have someone go over and hey, how you doing? Why don't we have a, a beer together so we can? You want to know what's going on next door. So I don't think all of the world's about like colonizing it. I think it's just trying to be involved with it enough so it doesn't either blow back on your side or it doesn't become something you can't, someone you can't trade with or deal with, but it's very complicated. It's not as simple as like a warmongering president. <clears throat> and ultimately no one brought up Iran-Contra, that was the, well, yeah, you got caught with Iran-Contra, yeah. But it was similar, it was like blurring the lines and triangulation again with Israel and selling of guns in Iran and all that, so. I, I don't know where I stand on that, by the way, for anyone who's gonna ask me. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Which might be a good coda, maybe, perhaps. We'll uh, see. We'll see, yeah, <laughs> is that, um, you don't address this in the film, because obviously, you know, at some level, this film is about this unique story, this relationship, but I'm going to, um, I don't know if it'll be saying the and throw a grenade is appropriate in this comment, but I'm gonna say that, um, I'm sitting there and I even leaned over and was talking to James and I was just like, so the US was sharing military secrets with the Vatican about the Soviet Union, right? How is that not treason? Article three, section three of the constitution talks about this. We're talking about treason, impeaching abused president now on the basis of treason. Although he today asked China also apparently to investigate the Biden. Wait, 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 go back a second. So tell me, wait, so the United States is sharing I'm not getting. I'm just trying to understand that if the U.S. is sharing military secrets right. with the Vatican, which is technically considered a theocracy, but side story. Well, they should, well, they, well, from within the framework of the narrative of the film, they're 
they're sharing that they're they're sharing satellite images and things with the Pope. Not that he's like the military leader, but they're sharing with it because I think there's a coordination of efforts. Not that the Vatican was becoming part of the military. It was just that the Vatican had an agenda by picking a Polish Pope to set free all those people, Catholics first, and then everyone else. So it wasn't like a coordinated effort. To, it was just that they knew they had the support. But where is that helping America? You mean because Amer I'm not getting the link, the parallel? Because you mean with foreign policy? I'm just saying yeah. is that you have the U.S. relationship with Russia, Soviet Union. Right. You have the U.S. relationship with the Vatican. Right. The Vatican itself does not have a military influence, but the Pope is clearly influential in global politics, right. as all the meetings with Gorbachev says. Right. But it just, and again, maybe I missed this part or I got it wrong, is that the way the film is structured, you know, with the music and all of that, it's building the story, and it almost made it seem like you have all these meetings, and as you said, like, you, you couldn't know what Reagan and the Pope are talking about mm -hmm. in their conversations. Right. Intimately, you, you have no idea yeah. to really know, but at some level, like, I don't know, I just, the idea of that Reagan is the first president to appoint, like, an ambassador to the Vatican. Um, and, you know, I think there's some irony now in that the um, U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, I believe, is Newt Gingrich's wife, mm -hmm. if I recall, right? But yeah, I actually I actually showed this at the White House with her. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. So, mm -hmm. I don't know, I just, there was something to me about that relationship that seemed not necessarily fully transparent to the American people as well, or to the global intelligence community. <laughs> That seemed more to me. No, more I'm, with, I'm with you about that. The point you're making generally about like the where where are the correct or incorrect? I, I don't know. And this is beyond the boundary of the story. But let's, sure. let's go there. So, um, what is the correct or incorrect boundaries of the state in being a fair player to the rest of the world? That's one thing. But I'm not I'm not buying the tree the, the link back to treason as if it's parallel to someone betraying the Article Three of the United States. I'm not getting where that. It's just it's an external. It's being friends with whoever you have to be to make as much peace and be successful in geopolitics. It's not using another cult country or partnership to rig your own success in, in your domestic. But you did say that they're both actors. Right. Why is it hard to assume that Reagan was using the Pope to, to create the influence that he himself could not attain by himself? I can't read his heart. I mean, I can't read what's... No, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm just... I, I'm um, from the evidence of what he did, I... I told you the story that I thought was sure. the best based on its. I can't read his heart. Like, did he was he ultimately? Was there, was there a bit of a showman to him? Sure. Or, I, don't, I don't want to analyze it psychologically. I bet you there's, a, there's probably a showman to every politician. Period. I 100 percent agree. But I don't think it's so in balance. You either stop there and you say because there's a little. This would be the cynical thing. I think because there's a little showman in every politician. All politicians are bad. Therefore, we can't ever talk about. So I say, no, you mount the evidence toward the tipping point of, can you tell an optimistic or an inspiring story based on the evidence you do know, in light of the possibility of there being a showman in politicians? Yeah, I think you can. And I tried to demonstrate that. Yeah. I do think your point about like what information was shared with the Vatican in this time of uh, like establishing the new ambassador and all this, and uh, you know, information being not all digital technology. It is a fair question of like, was was there at some point, and we will probably never know, like uh, too much information shared as what would be considered today, like especially in light of, um, in case you haven't read, I wouldn't have read when I was in college, Trump is in a lot of trouble for uh, asking foreign governments to investigate uh, Joe Biden and his son, just to give you that context. Oh, I'm so, sure they're following this. Maybe. I wouldn't have followed it in when I was in college. So um, you're much better than I am if you are. But so just asking this question of when, what is, could treason have occurred? And I think it's a fair question I'm just, to ask. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not taking away from. No, I'm, I'm still not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not. I want to understand what you're saying. I'm, I think just I'm just not seeing the parallel because I know what the present issue is. Right. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm not seeing that parallel. I'm just asking, yeah. and again, you and I can have this kind of continue this conversation yeah. later. Yeah. It's just in terms of the CIA. Like, and I mean, like this. This is a very, and I. This is a very pro-America film, mm -hmm. right? Like, this, the yeah. KGB is portrayed as like Voldemort, but the CIA and all of the 
horror that the CIA has caused is not really discussed, but again, that's not the point of the film. Mm -hmm. But to some knowledge, the idea of sharing CIA intelligence with the Pope, who is an unelected head of state in the only, one of only two theocracies in the world, the other is Iran, and then that, that somehow that was okay. He's technically elected. By whom? By, By uh, Cardinals. Okay. We've seen the smoke. We know he's elected. <laughs> yeah. Then the Ayatollah is elected by that count as well. Well, well I think, well, can I yeah. just, one more, and I'm, I'm going to go beyond, I'll, we could talk more about this, but so you're making kind of my point, like there's various, when I go out to different audiences, and maybe this will spark this quiet crowd here. So when I go out to different audiences, there's different reasons to talk about a film. One is to just react to the film. One is the issues it, it sparks about other larger issues. So I always have the balance, the act, the, the, the difficulty of, People bring up much broader issues that I can address within the context of a film and a 40 minute Q&A after it. So sometimes I don't want to respond totally because I'm thinking if we go there, then it drags the, the energy Absolutely. away from it. So, so what, I try, what I'm going to say now is that if the conversation would have started, and maybe, maybe we could do another one, or maybe we could do a seminar in the Cold War. Where are we at in the Cold War? How phony is America? Do they just tell their own people? I, I'm, we could talk about all that. Sure. But I'm saying, like, for the sake of this context, if you don't direct it in, in saying that if we talk about this as a geopolitical conversation or a biographical one beyond the narrative of the film, you're, it's opening it up to conversations that can't be backed. We can't really get into it, sure. and it's, it becomes sniping, and it's and it's too easy. And I, I'm not, I'm okay with it. I'm just saying it just doesn't seem like you can get to those types of questions because it's not what the context is now. But, but I would love to, another hour, I'd love to go step by step. So how in an imperfect world do you make geopolitical, how do you come to your perspective knowing history of corruption of CIA, do you measure it against the KGB? Would you ultimately therefore state because there's corruption that the democratic ideals are not worth striving for? Is it all phony? Do you tear it all down? I mean, these are philosophical questions that would take a semester to do. Well, Rob mentioned another hour. My role <laughs> is to reassure you that that's not going to happen. Uh, unless you wanted to, you're welcome to Every, hang out. Everyone Rob gets a check. Really everyone stay. gets a check uh, for, for but, being here. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to Rob and our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and please do, at the very least, grab a bookmark and take away some information about the movie, uh, which is going to be in theaters November 6th. But if you're interested in getting a copy of the book, I think Rob will even give autographed copies. Yeah. If you're interested, if you want to just say hi and uh, talk a little bit more, come come on over. Don't be shy. Uh, meet a filmmaker. Uh, get, get, thank you. Get your money for it. Thank you all for coming. I want to learn more about it.